the scriptures and to Philippians chapter 3. And we read through this chapter. Philippians chapter 3 and beginning at verse 1. This is God's holy and inspired and inerrant word. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, and let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. And may God bless this reading from his truth to our hearts. Let's just take a moment or two to pray and to remember some situations throughout the world at this stage. Father, we come now again into your presence in Jesus' name. And we're conscious, Father, as we pilgrim through this world, indeed at times we pilgrim through a barren land, we're conscious, Father, of the needs of many lands and nations at this time. We would pray, Lord, for the worrying and uh, concerning situation arising in Afghanistan. We pray, Lord, for your people there and for the church, though small it is and persecuted it is. Yet, Lord, there are some believers in that land, and we pray, Lord, for them and for their safety and well-being. We remember, Lord, those folks in 
Plymouth who Lord lives were cut down for families who mourn the loss of loved ones in such wickedness and destruction and Lord we pray again that you might remind many in our nation that life at best is very brief that we live in uncertain times and in an unsafe world and our hope and confidence can only be in Jesus Christ Father we pray for that day as you have reminded us to pray that your kingdom will come and that the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth as, and your glory may stretch from shore to shore so Lord we look to you now as we turn to your word and pray that you will help us bless us guide us and your spirit might illuminate our minds for Jesus sake Amen. The uh, verse I want us to turn to this morning is from our reading here in Philippians uh, chapter 3 and just those opening words in verse 20. In the authorised version we read, for our conversation is in heaven. And it may well be that you're following in another version where it speaks about our citizenship being in heaven. Uh, I, some of the, uh, I checked some of the uh, original language. I have a little sort of directory that helps me sort of sometimes just to compare when we come across a sentence and we're not sure about, but in the AV where it says, for our cons conversation is in heaven, it's a word that can also mean commonwealth. Uh, seemingly the original Greek word uh, can be interpreted as in commonwealth. And we do discover that word in the Bible. Uh, Paul uses it in Ephesians chapter 2 where he talks about um, people being aliens and strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. And it is also possible as in some of the other translations we have today to translate it as citizens, citizenship in heaven. And we want to think about that today. What does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? And as we come to think about that, I want to use four words this morning that will help us uh, just as we consider this whole question of being a citizen of heaven. And the first word I want us to think about is a word, identity. Identity. Perhaps over the last couple of weeks you may have watched some of the Olympic Games and you know there at the end of a particular uh, activity, sport, whatever, the winner is brought to the podium and the uh, flag of his or her nation is raised and the national anthem is um, sung and or at least the music's played anyway and if you were just to come into the house and you recognized it you would identify the person with a particular country you know which country they belong to and the apostle paul in this chapter is reminding us if you're a christian this morning that you have an identity uh, you have a song to sing as we thought of in Psalm 96 there are a new song to sing you have an identity because you're in Christ Jesus and that's actually how Paul at the beginning of this letter to the Philippians uh, describes he opens by saying Paul and Timothy the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus if you're a citizen of God's kingdom if you're a citizen of heaven then you have got to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul reminds us of this in this chapter between verses 2 and 10 he gives us really his his pedigree he reminds us of what he once was and of what he now is and he gives there if there was one who could get to heaven by his own works and his own righteousness he was the candidate look at those words again where he says 
circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, in terms of following the law, perfection as far as he was concerned. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. And concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was doing what he thought was right. And he talks there about people who have confidence in the flesh. Confidence in their own way, in their own strength, and in their own ability to be right with God. But something happens to Paul, and we all know the story, doesn't it? Where he meets the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, and his life is transformed and changed. He's converted. He becomes a Christian. And he says in verse 7 of Philippians 3, But what things were gained to me, these I counted for loss in Christ. That transformation brought him to a new situation, to a new outlook, and to a new life. His life was now in Christ Jesus. And in verse 8 he tells us, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Christ becomes the dominant figure in his life. His love for Christ overwhelms him and takes over his life. And he says, I am now found in him, not having my own righteousness, but that righteousness which is of God by faith. Here he reminds us of the great fundamental truth of the gospel. There's nothing in my hand I bring. It's simply to the cross I cling. And this is Paul's experience. He has found that righteousness. He has been redeemed. And he is now dressed in that robe of righteousness. And it's a righteousness that comes by faith. And that's why he can say, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, that question is, that's something we can say. Our citizenship is in heaven. Not because of our good works and righteousness, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. What's your identity this morning? Are you identified with the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he your saviour? Or are you a stranger? Ephesians 2, that chapter, verse 12, 13, Paul again reminds us of the only two positions people can be in. You're either a stranger and an alien to God's kingdom, or you have been redeemed and brought near by the blood of Christ. So the challenge comes to us this morning, are we trusting in Christ? Are we trusting in him alone for salvation? Our citizenship in heaven, our identity is in Christ. It is by faith that we live in him. But the second word I want us to think about this morning as we think of citizenship and being a citizen of heaven is security. We've had identity, now we have security. We live in a very unsafe and insecure world at the moment, don't we? We're never sure what is going to happen next, and we've witnessed the news bulletin this week of that tragedy in, in Plymouth. No one could have predicted that. No one could have foretold that. And it speaks to us of just how unsafe the world is. We truly know not what a day brings forth not only in our land, but in our own uh, personal lives. But the word comes and reminds us that those who are in Christ Jesus are safe and secure. Isn't there that old hymn we sing sometimes? Safe and secure from all alarms. And that's our situation in Christ Jesus. If we're trusting in him, that we are safe and secure. The Apostle Paul reminds us there in verse 12 of this chapter where he says, Christ Jesus has made me his own. We're safe.
safe in Jesus' hands. And it echoes the words of uh, Jesus in John chapter 6. You remember those words where he says, All that the Father gives to me shall come to me, and those that come unto me will in no wise be cast out. Those that are truly in Christ can never lose their salvation. They are safe and secure. And there's no safer place to be this morning than to be in Jesus Christ. John Murray, that uh, old Scottish theologian of the last century, put it like this. He says, Christ will assuredly embrace in the arms of saving and loving security the person who comes to him. Chapter 1 of Philippians, Paul reminds us that though Jesus, those who have faith in Christ, Jesus has begun this good work in you. And he says he will bring it to completion. The Lord Jesus is with us every step of the way, day by day, moment by moment. He will not let you go. Some people think that you can be saved one day and lost the next day. But, you know, as we read through the scriptures, we find that that is not the teaching of scripture. The true believer can never be lost. Now, yes, we've all met people that maybe a few years ago were seemed to be bright and shining Christians for the Lord, and today they're nowhere. And we might ask, well, what's gone wrong there? And there really only can be two answers or two positions to that particular person. One is that they were never truly converted, or that they're in a seriously backsliding state and not walking with God at the moment and out of fellowship with him. But such will be restored and will come to heaven. And we're reminded here that we are secure in Jesus' arms. The true believer will never be lost. We need to go back to Jesus' clear teaching in John 6 and read those words again. All that the Father gives to me and he that comes to me, I will never cast out. And then later in John 10, there's these words, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. And it's not just something we read in the New Testament. We find it in the Old Testament. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 125. And there the psalmist reminds us, uh, they and the Lord that firmly trust shall be like Zion Hill at no time can be removed. We're safe and secure in Jesus Christ. And if you're in Christ this morning, that's your status. As we've said, the world is a most insecure place. We know not what happens in the week that lies ahead. But if we're trusting in Christ, we can go forth in confidence and an assurance that he is with us and will lead us. The Westminster Confession reminds us those whom God has accepted in his beloved, effectually called, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace. That doesn't mean we're perfect. We may stumble along the pilgrim pathway, and there are dark days as well as bright days. But there's another hymn that reminds us, He will keep me till the river rolls its water at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over, made by grace for glory meet. And it's that little line that brings us to our third word, made by grace for glory meet. It speaks to us of a destiny. A destiny. Our citizenship is in heaven. And that's the destiny of every believer. And Paul tells us, even in this chapter again, that he's pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We are to quote a title of one of John Murray's sermons. He giveth the title, The Pilgrim.
pilgrimage to perfection. We're not perfect, but one day we're reminded in the scriptures that we enter into the kingdom of heaven, we shall be changed, we shall see Jesus, and we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But in our journey towards heaven, we're reminded that the pilgrim path is one of endurance and perseverance. There are many trials along the way. There are many bumps on the road. There are many twists and turns. But the Lord has assured us that those who trust in him, he will bring into his presence one day in heaven. And it's not just endurance, but there is that perseverance. And the scriptures remind us that those that persevere to the end shall be saved. There are challenges of faith that come to us. There are days when perhaps you have doubts and you wonder. But God brings us back to his word and restores us to fellowship with him. And if we read our text clearly there that not only is our citizenship in heaven, but we're told there we also await for the Saviour. We've been reminded that there's a day coming when Jesus will return to this earth. There's a day coming when he will manifest his power and glory. There's a day coming when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yet it's something that's scoffed about today and scorned by the world, isn't it? You hear remarks even on some comedy programs or television programs about something being as reliable as the second coming of Christ. Utter blasphemy. But that's where the world is. It's a doctrine that is scorned and ignored today by the world at large. And then sometimes even the church is guilty of ignoring this important truth that Jesus is coming again. And it should be something that's in the forefront of our minds because Paul talks about pressing towards the goal. And what's the goal? The goal of entering into heaven. And while we're passing through our earthly pilgrimage, we're to be engaged in the work of God, to be serving him and to be witnessing for him. Living with the coming of Christ again in our minds. John, you remember, uh, writes in chapter 14 where he tells the account of Jesus saying to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again and take you to be with me. And then there's that little phrase, look, if it were not so, I would tell you. In other words, this is the absolute truth that Jesus is preparing a place for those who love him and trust him and are following after him. There's a day coming when Jesus again will return to this earth in power and glory. We read about it in Thessalonians and there again of the trumpet sounding and of the Lord appearing and taking unto himself is redeemed. But here in this little verse it also speaks of a transformation and it tells us there that our lowly bodies will be transformed or as the authorised version put it there our vile bodies. It's reminding us that our sinful nature will be finished and that we will be transformed and our bodies glorified like the glorified body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Question 38 in the Shorter Catechism uh, tells us, it asks, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? At the resurrection, Christ will immediately raise up in glory all believers. He will openly acknowledge and acquit them in the judgment. Gracious
graciously rewarding them according to their works of faith and they will enter into the full enjoyment of God for all eternity. Our bodies will be transformed and we will enter into the joy and presence of the Lord for all eternity. And this is a message of hope to a dying world and it's a message of hope that the Church of Jesus Christ needs to be uh, proclaiming today with great authority and power. Robert Murray McShane uh, wrote a hymn and the opening lines was, When this passing world is done. And that's the reality, that one day this world will pass, it will be gone uh, forever. But a day is coming when we shall be like Jesus because we shall see him as he is. There will be perfection. No more sin. No more suffering. No more sadness. No more tears. Because we're told God will wipe away every tear. There will be perfect peace. No more will we have the conflict and battle with sin. It's a land of purity. There will be no more sin. It will be in the glory and splendor of heaven with God upon the throne and Christ Jesus by his right hand. Is that your hope today? Are you on that journey? We thought about identity. We thought about uh, security. And we thought about the destiny. But in some of our translations, and maybe one that you read at home or follow this morning, you'll notice that verse 1 of chapter 4 is linked into chapter 3. You'll remember, of course, when the Bible was written that uh, it wasn't divided into verses and chapters, but it was done by the translators to help us and to help us to read it and understand it. And it starts there in verse 1, and should have read it during the reading. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And when we say that word, therefore, it's really saying, look, in light of what we've been thinking about, in light of what we're saying, therefore, I want you to do this. And so our fourth word is, Unity. Unity. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. In other words, just what Paul has been saying, he calls his beloved brothers to stand firm in the Lord. All the great doctrinal truths in this chapter that we've been thinking about, about salvation, about heaven, about God's safety and security for us, we come to the practical implications because we can read the Bible, but we've got to ask ourselves, well, what's this for me? How do I apply this to my own situation? And Paul's really saying to us here in this verse, look, there's a code of conduct here to be followed. If you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you're to follow a code of conduct. And, you know, as citizens of whatever country we're in, we're to follow the rules and obey the laws of the land. And the implication here is that we're to follow God's laws and God's commands. And he says, to stand firm in the Lord. And it's really a reiteration of what he says in verse 27 of chapter 1. You might want to look that up. Chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Be of one mind strive together and the challenge is really to let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ and he wants to hear that they're standing firm that they're standing on the fundamentals of the faith and on the truth of the gospel in one spirit with one mind striving side by side unity among God's people is important and it's essential to show that we're worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now often there's unity and diversity and we recognize that because God gives different gifts and when we speak about unity in the scriptures it doesn't mean we're all clones and we're all the
the same. But he is saying that, as one man I remember saying many years ago, we're to be firm on the fundamentals and flexible on the incidentals. We're to stand and strive together for the truth of the gospel, for the salvation that Jesus offers, and to shed forth and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. This morning we're called to stand fast in the faith, to hold on to the truth of God's word. You know, we live in an age where even in the professing Christian church, the word of God is often set aside. And people follow the traditions of man. And Paul comes and challenges us here. If we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we're to stand firm on the truth of God's word. Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, says, A man that stands steadfast is like a man on a rock. He that stands fast by the power of the Spirit enjoys liberty and freedom. We live in difficult days, don't we? difficult to be a Christian. There's pressure on the Lord's people. Uh, there's pressure on society all around us. The rules and the commands of God are set aside by governments. We're now in situations and laws in our land that 10 years ago we wouldn't have believed would have come this way. And so the challenge for us as the Lord's people is to stand firm, to stand fast, to hold on to the truth. When we're challenged, when the pressures of society comes in upon us, we need, as, as, as Paul reminds us in Romans 12, to guard our minds, to hold on to his truth. And the truth is that what Jesus has done for us, that he offers salvation, that he is the victor over death and of hell, and his glorious resurrection and defeat of the, of the devil, the call to his people is to stand fast, striving together. That word sort of uh, gives us the picture of, 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 of soldiers striving together, pulling together to defeat the enemy. And so God's people are to strive together against a spiritually hostile environment. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that we're ambassadors for Christ. And basically, if we're citizens of God's kingdom, then it naturally falls that we are ambassadors for Christ. We're to represent him in this day and age in which we live. If we're citizens in he of heaven, then we're to live as such. We're to follow the guidelines. We're to obey his command. The psalmist reminds us of the blessings of unity. It's a great tragedy, isn't it, when we see division among Christian folks over matters that are not of fundamental nature. The psalmist reminds us that it's a real delight to God to see unity amongst brothers and sisters. God's people dwelling together, standing together, and striving together citizens of heaven, our identity in Christ, our security, well, we're safe in the arms of Jesus, and our destiny, well, we're on that road to heaven, and our unity is to be seen in harmony and fellowship amongst the people of God. This is the challenge that comes to us this morning. If we're followers of Jesus Christ, if we're really seeking to live for him, if we can say that we're citizens of heaven, that we declare his truth, and that we await that day when our bodies will be fashioned like unto his glorious body, and that we will be with Jesus forever. Well, may God bless these thoughts to us this morning, and help us as we seek to live for him in these difficult days. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do again just bow before you with thankful hearts that you have redeemed us. You have called us 
to be your children, to be citizens of heaven. And help us, Lord, as we live for you in these days. Help us, Lord, not to be ashamed of our identity. Help us, Lord, to know that you're ever with us, that you protect us, and that you shield us, and that you keep us. And Lord, we pray indeed as we journey on the pilgrim pathway that in all the challenges of life, O oh Father, we might experience your grace, your help, and your joy. And help us, Lord, to dearly love one another. Father, we're reminded so often in your word that the hallmark of the Christian is love for one another. So help us, Lord, to exemplify that in what we say, in what we do, and in every aspect of our lives. Lord, bless us this day, we pray. Help us to use this day aright for your glory, to rest as your word commands us, and to enjoy the company of your people and the blessings of your hand upon us. For Jesus' sake, amen. going to sing again it's found in the book of praise and uh, I've forgotten the number Hell, you can maybe 312 not forgotten it I didn't write it down so 312 one of the great old paraphrases reminds us of the amazing gift of love that God bestowed upon that the father bestowed upon us that we, the sinful sons of men, should be called the sons of God. And then, just in verse 4, he reminds us there of when he appears, we shall bear his image bright. And it is a hope so great and so divine. Let's sing these words to the praise of God. Son and Holy Spirit rest and abide with us all this day and forevermore.